All right, so Jim gave you two definitions that you may not have heard previously, which are open source AI models and open science AI models. And so to give you an idea of the differentiation between the two, really, if you think of both use permissive licensing, right? And the, the real difference between the two is that open science is really geared towards academic research and reproducibility and higher levels of transparency that we don't see generally with a lot of the open source models. Um, and so the, the big difference there again is the data sets, right? And, and there's very limited number of organizations that can repro reproduce like a 405 billion parameter model, um, you know, running hundreds of millions of dollars in training costs. And so I'd like to take the definition a little wider here and talk about open source AI as a larger movement, right? And so open source AI goes back you know, over a decade uh, and includes a really broad ecosystem of other projects that are really oriented towards the frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow and inference engines and like VLLM and DeepSpeed and a lot of really great projects that have helped advance open source AI and get us to the point where we are today, uh, both with proprietary models and with uh, open models. And so why does this whole open source AI ecosystem matter, right? And I think we can all agree that open source helps democratize access to some of the latest and greatest technologies that normally we wouldn't have access to, uh, and especially reducing barriers to entry around some of these really highly parameterized models that nobody really has the computational budget for. Uh, there's a really great community of AI researchers, developers, enthusiasts, fine tuners that have come together and share information and work together to try and achieve uh, common outcomes and really to innovate in this very fast moving space of AI. Um, there's also limitation, uh, you know, the advantage here too is limiting vendor lock-in. So if we look at frameworks like PyTorch, right, they have different backends. It has different backends to support AMD, G, you know, NVIDIA and, and others in Intel. And you can still use the same code you have and basically build for different uh, hardware architectures. Uh, and then, you know, taking uh, current, you know, the conventional models today that are, are closed models, you're egressing your private data. You're egressing data from your organization. And if you want to host your own models in-house, then, and those are open source models, you can host them in your own cloud and you never have to egress data. You don't have to have those same concerns. Um, and, and, you know, there's a really great community here growing that is, is thriving in the, you know, fast moving AI space. And so I wanted to share with you a case study you may have heard already, but this is a really clear example of how open source AI models, and, and as opposed to open science, uh, are really valuable to the, to the, um, really to the industry. And so uh, Rakuten took Mistral 7B, right, which is a permissively licensed under Apache 2.0 open source model, and you know, they took that, they built a, a Japanese tokenizer on top of it to help increase the uh, throughput and efficiency with their token budget. And they sourced a like, high quality Japanese data, right, to be able to fine tune the model for their purposes and address their use cases. And so this model was then re-released in open source and you know, it was released earlier this year, but it really outperformed a lot of the state of the art in, in Japanese models. Um, All right, and so there is one you know, caveat with all, well, a lot of the state-of-the-art models today is that they are trained on English language data, which includes Western biases, and so they're really, we really need to see more cultural and linguistically diverse data in these models, uh, you know, curation of Japanese text and, and data that can be used for pre-training to help really enhance uh, the cultural aspects of, of language here. Um, I would also recommend for Japanese organizations to invest in local AI research, right? There is a lot of research happening in Silicon Valley. There's a very you know, prominent community in AI research in Paris, but I wouldn't allow those communities to sort of uh, dictate the future of, of your needs with AI. And so, you know, invest locally. 
Uh, also, build up your talent and uh, through training and certifications, this can really help your organizations get ready for the next generation of, of uh, AI-based technologies within the enterprise. Uh, and then look at the prioritizing your use cases. Find those use cases that are really going to give you the best you know, cost benefit, right? Which is your customer experience, your you know, enhanced customer experience. Uh, look at driving operational efficiencies through more automation. And you can unlock new revenue streams with, with AI systems that you previously uh, didn't have an opportunity to, especially with generative AI. And so I just want to quickly share with you some things that are happening with the PyTorch Foundation in 2025. So we are launching an ambassador program, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in being a PyTorch ambassador, to come speak to me at the conference to, uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, these are the folks that are going to be leading the charge on regional events, on advocating for PyTorch, and helping really develop the, the deep learning and AI community here in, in, in Japan. Um, we also have a training and certification program that will be launched in the second half of next year. And that program, again, very much oriented towards PyTorch, but strong emphasis on uh, you know, the state of the art in AI. And then the PyTorch conference will be taking place in October of uh, next year in San Francisco. And this is a great opportunity to network, to get involved in the global community, and to really uh, learn more about the state of the art in, in uh, AI innovations. And so if you are interested in joining the PyTorch Foundation, if your company is interested in getting involved, you know, please reach out to me or uh, you know, visit pytorch.org slash join and uh, apply as a member. And thank you very much. So I, I, a fun statistic, you know, the PyTorch community has thousands and thousands of developers working in it, right? right. Like it continues to grow every day. But the core maintainers of PyTorch are actually a pretty small group. Like more than half of PyTorch's code is written by a couple of dozen developers. And the reason I bring this up is because there's a real opportunity for Japanese developers to come meet those people. Next year in October at our PyTorch conference, that's the place where all these developers get together. Uh, over the next year, we're gonna bring more of those developers here to Japan. You know, Japan has really unique requirements for the way that they're building large language models. There's differences in the language and culture and the way that you would build these models. But I think there's a real opportunity to bring together these elite developers that live in the PyTorch community and have them work hand in hand with Japanese developers here to create a better outcome for everyone. So please come to the conference next year. Matt, thank you so much yeah, for course. all of your great work. Thank you. With that, I'm gonna have Nori come back. Thank you so much and introduce our next speaker.